So in this video I'm going to take a look at the resistance of different materials and how you can change it and then look at some highly specialized components which don't behave in a way you'd expect or like your conventionally conventional logic would predict. Okay. So first of all, what is resistance? Well, there are various factors which affect it, but we need to understand what it is first. So essentially, in order to move energy around your circuit, free electrons or charged particles need to be able to move. And it's not quite as simple as an electron goes from the battery to the light bulb or whatever and gives it some energy. It's not as simple as that. It's, there's like a chain reaction and all this sort of stuff. But essentially, they need to move through the material and resistance is what essentially the material preventing those electrons flowing around the circuit or preventing the flow of charge around your circuit. And there's various factors which can influence this. So one factor is the cross-sectional area. Another one is the length of your, and the other one is the energy of the blocking atoms. So if you increase the cross-sectional area of your wire, for instance, you're a, if you're looking at it from a cross-section point of view, essentially you've opened up a large amount more space. So more electrons can pass through that wire per second because you've created more space for them to move through. And essentially doubling the cross-sectional area will double the current or halve the resistance, essentially, as a linear relationship. A longer wire means that an electron trying to go through the wire or a charge trying to flow through the wire encounters twice as many resistive atoms. So if it's double the length, there's twice as many atoms. So double length means double the resistance. So there's a linear relationship there between resistance and length, whereas before it was a linear relationship between current and the cross-section area. We'll have a look at the equation in a second, which governs all of this. The last one is a bit more complicated. So if the blocking atoms have energy, so the free electrons have come from atoms, so the atoms are still there, and they can move around and they can get in the way of the charge trying to flow through. And the more energy they have, the more obstructive they are to the electrons, and the, so the resistance will increase with that. Okay. So... Let's have a look at the equation to actually calculate resistance. So there's three parts to it. So to calculate the resistance, or big R, we use this symbol here for resistivity of the material. This term L for the length and A for the cross-sectional area. Now resistivity is to take into account the structure of the material. So it looks at how the structure affects the resistance and also allows you to integrate the temperature into it as well. So a material at a certain temperature will have a fixed resistivity. So if I've got two copper wires at 20 degrees, copper would have the same resistivity in both those wires. It's like a constant. Um, but you can change that value by changing the temperature. Okay, so that's resistivity. So let's have a look at an example. So we've got a material with resistivity of 2.0 ohm meters. And we want to look at the resistance if it has a diameter of 1.0 millimetres and a length of 20 centimetres. First thing, let's think about our equation that we're using here. So in its simplest form, it looks like this. So if we look in the question, length of 20 centimetres, so we've got this. Resistivity of 2.0 got this and it tells you the diameter so what we need to do is a way of converting from the diameter to this cross-sectional area so what we're going to do is we're going to model the wire as a cylinder it's quite cylindrical it's not a bad approximation which allows us to convert so if we've got a diameter we're going to use this equation here to calculate the cross-sectional area so that's going to be pi times by remembering to convert into meters when you're using an equation. So square that, you're going to divide it by 4, and you end up with 7.85 blah, 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 times 10 to the minus 7 meters squared. At this point, let's convert 
the length into meters, so it's in our correct SI unit. And now we're at a point where we can put all these into our calculations. So we've got 2.0 times 0.2 all over 7.85 blah, 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 times 10 minus 7, which equals 5.1 times 10 to the 5 ohms, or if you like, 5.1 times 10 to the 2 kilo ohms. There. So we look at this value. This is a very, very big resistance. This would be a terrible wire to use in a circuit um, if you've got a resistivity of 2.0. So bear that in mind with the link with these, and you'll often see resistivities a lot lower than that for actual wires, and that way you actually get a serviceable wire. So this is a very, very big resistance we're looking at here. So as usual, yeah, we've got the typed out solutions to this. Again, the key part here was modeling the wire as a cylinder, which means its cross-section area is a circle. That's what allowed us to take these steps here, and that's a very good approximation. Okay, so let's look at temperature and resistivity because there is a relationship between them. So as a general rule, increasing the temperature increases the resistivity of the material. If you increase the resistivity while keeping the length and the area the same, you're going to increase the resistance. But there are a few anomalies to this, and we need to know about those and be aware of them. So one of those outliers is an NTC thermistor, and NTC means negative, negative temperature coefficient. So what that means is, as the temperature increases, the resistance, or sorry, the resistivity decreases, which decreases the resistance. Why? Well, and a thermistor is based on a semiconductor. And what can happen is that when you increase the temperature, you actually increase the number of charge carriers or free electrons available, which results in an increase in current or a decrease in resistance. And this decrease in resistance more than compensates for the increase caused by the temperature, so you get a net decrease in resistance there. So that's an NTC thermistor. Most components are PTC, which means positive temperature coefficient, so that as you increase the temperature, the resistivity increases and the resistance, therefore, increases. So, as I mentioned, the NTC is an example of a semiconductor, and there's a few other semiconductors that you will come across. Another one you'll encounter based on a semiconductor is an LDR, or a light-dependent resistor. And this is essentially a device that's resistance or resistivity depends on the light intensity. So if you're shining a light on it and more photons arrive per second, you increase the intensity, the resistance of it decreases because again, it releases more charge carriers. Okay, so those are a couple of examples where the behavior is not quite as you'd expect. Another type that's not the same is quite cool and there's many cool YouTube videos about using superconductors though you can do amazing stuff. Anyway, um, a superconductor is a material that when you cool it to a certain temperature, it has zero resistivity. That's the definition of a superconductor. And because it has zero resistivity, it has zero resistance. And the temperature at which it first has zero resistivity is called the critical or the transition temperature. And we can see here with mercury, this is about 4.2 Kelvin, which is ridiculously cold. And we have the transition temperature or the critical temperature around here. So it's the first point. So it's about here. And this is very useful because if you have zero resistivity and zero resistance, you have no energy losses. And because of that, that would be extremely useful. So a couple of things that they're being considered to use for, the technology is not really good enough yet, is using them in electromagnets. They've started to integrate this sort of thing into electromagnets. Like if you go look at the CERN uh, ring, that type of thing, they're starting to use supercooled electromagnets. And the other thing you could have them used for is power cables connecting power plants. So it wouldn't make sense to connect homes to power plants with them because the losses aren't that great anyway. But connecting power plants, backing up power plants, could be really useful having them as power cables because again, no losses. 
and to dig into that a little bit more, explaining why there's no index. There's a couple of things you need to know. First of all, you can calculate the amount of energy that a device is going to emit as thermal energy or heat using this equation here. So the energy emitted is the current squared times the resistance times the time for which the current flows. And that's the energy emitted as heat or thermal energy. So things like a resistor, it transfers electrical energy into thermal energy. That's what a resistor does. And so if we do some messing around with this, we know that power is energy divided by time. So we're taking this time across to this side. So we know the power loss or as heat is I squared R. So it's dependent on both the current and the resistance. So if you have zero resistivity and zero resistance, this R in the equation becomes zero. So there's no power loss or there's no energy dissipated by the material, even if you have a current flowing through it because R is zero. And that's really useful. And that's one of the areas of current research to do with circuitry.